Hi, I'm Pastor Jeremy, and welcome to the preaching ministry of Nest Baptist, where we seek to equip people to love God and love others. So whether you are a longtime follower of Jesus, or you're exploring what faith in Him might look like, we're glad you're here. It is our prayer that through our sermons, you might better understand who God is, what He has done for you, and what that means for your life. May all of this lead to the worship of God and be for His glory. The scripture that I'll be reading today is from Mark 12, verses 13 to 17, and I'll be reading from the ESV. And they sent to him some of the Pharisees and some of the Herodians to trap him in his talk. And they came and said to him, Teacher, we know that you are true and do not care about anyone's opinion, for you are not swayed by appearances, but truly teach the way of God. Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? Should we pay them or should we not? But knowing their hypocrisy, he said to them, Why put me to the test? Bring me a denarius and let me look at it. And they brought one, and he said to them, Whose likeness and inscription is this? They said to him, Caesar's. Jesus said to them, Render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. And they marveled at him. And myself sat there. Good morning. Uh, I think it's fair to say that Jesus Christ is the most maligned person to have ever walked the face of the earth. For nearly 2,000 years, he's been scorned, slandered, and mocked by both angry and careless blasphemers. In Western culture, people don't bat an eye at uh, using his precious uh, name as an expression of profanity. Countless followers of Jesus have been tortured and murdered over the years for his name's sake. And then contemporary novelists like Dan Brown and his Da Vinci Code have even disparaged Christ's character by portraying him as uh, committing sexual improprieties with Mary Magdalene, among sort of things. Remarkably, these demeaning comments and unfavorable opinions about Christ, they typically come from people who never even met the man. But even amongst those who did meet him were some who hated him. On more than one occasion, the Jewish mob tried to stone Jesus for what he said. On top of that, the Jewish religious authorities continually looked for ways to trap him so that he could be arrested and perhaps even executed. And as early as the, the third chapter, the third chapter of Mark, after Jesus healed the deformed hand of a man on the Sabbath, we read, at once the Pharisees went away and met with some of the supporters of Herod to plot how to kill Jesus. I'm always struck by the irony of this situation. Here we, we, we have Jesus bringing great joy and relief to a man who has suffered terribly for a, a long time. And then the response, kill him. And again, that's, that's by Mark 3. Now, our story today in Mark 12 is part of this ongoing narrative that pits the enemies of Jesus against our Lord. And interestingly, the antagonists who bring their loaded question to Jesus, they, they actually belong to the same two groups of people who started this plot nine chapters earlier in, in Mark, the Pharisees and the Herodians. So here's the setting. The time is during the week after the triumphal entry of Jesus into Jerusalem, and he's teaching in the temple. And the question regarding paying tribute to the uh, Roman supreme leader, it's actually the second question that the, the, the religious authorities bring to Jesus on that day. Earlier in the day, they had asked them, by what authority do you do these things? And if you recall, Jesus had sort of a counter little, or a clever counter question of, of, about John the Baptist, and that kind of shut them up for a while. Uh, but then when, when Jesus... <clears throat> told the parable of the evil tenant farmers with the implication that the teachers of the religious law were in fact the villains in the story, they, they got really ticked off and they came back with another attack using the matter of paying tribute to Caesar as their premise. But this new attack, as we already heard, it, it arrives sugar-coated. Mark 12, 13, later the leader sent some Pharisees and supporters of Herod to trap Jesus into saying something for which he could be arrested. Teacher, they said, we know how honest you are. 
You are impartial and you don't play favorites. You teach the way of God truthfully. Now tell us, is it right to pay taxes to Caesar or not? Should we pay them or shouldn't we? Now the payment of tribute to the Romans, it was a burning question of the day. It aroused the deepest religious and nationalistic feelings amongst the Jews. So the Sanhedrin, they sent some characters to try to trap Jesus into saying something maybe illegal or perhaps uproarious. And in Matthew's version of the story, we see that they actually sent some disciples of the Pharisees, thinking that, you know, these keen disciples, uh, that Jesus might not recognize them as, you know, avowed enemies. But anyway, they, they, they come and uh, they're, they're joined with, uh, with the Pharisees, are joined the Herodians. Now, Herodians are political supporters of of Herod Antipas, and he was one of the Jewish puppet kings that had been put in place by the Roman government. So the Pharisees, well, you know, they're known for their intense nationalism. They keenly objected, obviously, to paying, uh, well, to any kind of foreign domination. So they opposed paying this tribute to the Romans. Uh, in theory, they actually did it to stay out of trouble. But the supporters of Herod, however, that, that's kind of a different story. They, they're very dependent on Roman favor. So they saw the payment as, of the tax as advantageous. So you got this alliance between these conflicting parties and they're both coming together because they're motivated with this common desire to destroy Jesus. So from the get-go, Mark makes it very clear in his account that these questioners had sinister motives. They wanted to trap Jesus in his answer, to, to catch him like a hunter catches its its prey in a snare or a, or a net. And to do so, they, they had to design the, the question perfectly. And uh, as we saw also, they had to start off with several thick layers of flattery. Jesus, we know that you're such an honest guy. We appreciate your integrity of character and that, you know, you're always so transparent. We, we know that, that you're not impartial. You're not the kind of guy who plays favorites and, and you're teaching. Well, your teaching's awesome. You know, you always do such a great job of explaining the word of God so truthfully to us. So based on all these wonderful qualities that you possess, you know, we're convinced you're going to give us a great answer to this question. This, this question is burning on our hearts. You know, we're just so confused on the matter and we really want your take on it. So we know what to do. Should we pay taxes to Caesar or not? <laughs> Interesting question. Is it right? Is it lawful? Is it permissible? This, this stressed that the question needed to be decided in harmony with the demands of the Torah, the Jewish religious law. And according to the Torah, there was no room for outside individuals becoming their king. Ideally, God was to be their king. But in the event that they did pick a human sovereign, Deuteronomy 17, 15 stipulates, select as king the man the Lord God chooses. You must appoint a fellow Israelite. He may not be a foreigner. So that's kind of in their, their minds. Now, as I said, ultimately God was to be their ruler, a uh, theocracy, as we call it. Jewish people giving tribute to Caesar would appear to be an act of disloyalty to the divine government. Now, the specific tax that they're referring to here is an annual poll tax or a head tax that had been imposed by the Roman emperor, and the money went straight into the imperial treasury. And it was established in Judea in AD 6, and it was extremely unpopular with the Jewish people. And, and by their phrasing of the question, the plotters had hoped to lock Jesus into an either-or situation, thereby putting him in a lose-lose scenario. Is it right to pay or not? Should we pay it or shouldn't we? On the surface, Jesus looked like he was hooped. I mean, how can he get out of this situation? If he says yes, then he would have greatly offend the people, discredit his messianic claims, because, I mean, how could anybody who claimed to be the Messiah conceivably approve of such subservience to a pagan, Yahweh-hating government. How could you do it? On the other hand, if Jesus said no, then he could be reported to the Roman government as a rebel. Now Luke's account of this story is very clear in this. In Luke 20:20, 20, 20, we read, they tried to get Jesus to say something that could be reported to the Roman governor so he would arrest him. So the schemers were most likely just licking their lips, drooling over the, the answer that they believed was going to indict their enemy. 
They had him. So they thought. But the text says, Jesus saw through their hypocrisy and said, why are you trying to trap me? Jesus had no problem reading through their duplicity. Their, their cleverly chosen words did not deceive them for a moment. Their, their question was not sincere. Both groups were already paying the tax out of expediency. Th- th- these were not honest inquirers. They were just deliberate liars, and Jesus let them know so. And proceeding on, he says to them, bring me a denarius and let me look at it. Now, a denarius, it was a small silver coin minted by the Roman government, and it was equivalent to the value of uh, a common labor, a day's labor of a common labor in in the vineyard. So Jesus basically says, go get me a piece of your currency. I'll look at it, and then I'll give you an answer. Verse 16 says, and they brought one. And he said to them, whose likeness and inscription is this? They said to him, Caesar's. The New Living Translation says, whose picture and title are stamped on this? Now, the coin that Jesus held in his hand, it would have carried the image of one, either one of two Caesars. It would have had the image of, of Augustus, the Roman emperor at Jesus' birth, or, or his successor, Tiberius. Both of these coins were in circulation at the time. Now, the, the latter coin, Tiberius's coin, would have said, along with his image, it would have said, Tiberius Caesar Augustus, the son of the divine Augustus. And on the flip side of the coin, it would say, chief priest. The Jews objected to the coin not only because of the image, but because of the, uh, the inscription proclaiming that Tiberius was divine. It's something that all the Roman emperors eventually did. They all claimed to be God. It's a thing to do. Now, when Jesus asked whose image was on the coin, they simply said, Caesar's. Now, that title had already been well in effect, I think, for about 60 years by this point in time. And the very simple fact that this Roman coin was their official currency. It's circulating in Palestine. It proved that Rome had financial jurisdiction over them. It established Caesar's authority in their midst and demonstrated that the Roman government had the right to demand taxes from them. Just like when we look at our money and we see images of prime ministers or Queen Elizabeth on our currency, that implies that the Canadian federal government has the right to impose taxes on us. So the first part of Jesus' answer is straightforward, but it's the second part that totally blows them away. Well then, Jesus said, give to Caesar what belongs to Caesar and give to God what belongs to God. His reply completely amazed them. Or as the ESV says, they marveled at him. You see, the coin represented the things that were Caesar's, the rights and duties belonging to the realm of human government. Now, in daily life, the Jewish people would have reaped the benefits of Roman roads and aqueducts and just general imperial stability. They therefore had the duty to, to, to pay back to Caesar as a debt, the things that belong to Caesar. Again, their use of the coin clearly proclaimed their obligation to the government that it represented. But the second part of Jesus' reply reminded them that they also had an abiding obligation to God. And the duty to God did not eliminate the duty to human government. See, Jesus' opponents they had formulated the question on the assumption that these two duties are incompatible. But Jesus insisted, no, they're not in a battle. There's no conflict between the two. It's not an either-or situation. It's a both-and. I mean, it's no wonder Jesus' response left the schemers marveled and amazed. I mean, they came in all excited, thinking that this sneaky, foolproof plan, and they walked out silent and stymied in their failed attempt to snare the Master, the Messiah. Well, that's the story, but what, what does it mean for us today? Practically, I mean, obviously we could have debates about uh, the tax issues we face, whether they're just and fair, carbon tax and all that. But, you know, I don't think it would be very profitable. In the grand scheme of things, 
I think we have to admit as Canadians and compared to the rest of the world, you know, we're, we're, uh, we're, we're doing pretty well. And I think we probably just need to pay the taxes that we owe. Give to Caesar what belongs to Caesar. But more importantly, what does it mean to give to God what belongs to God? That's the crux of the matter. You know, at first brush, you might think, oh, what are we going to, this is a tithing sermon? Did, you know, Pastor Jeremy tip you on? He doesn't want to talk about it. You know, <laughs> yes, I guess it is a tithing issue, but, you know, it goes so, so far, far deeper than that. And I, I think the best place to start this discussion of what does it mean to give to God what belongs to God is to consider the use of the word in the original language, in the passage that's representing the imprint on the coin, on the denarius. When Jesus asks whose picture or likeness is on this coin, the Greek word that he used is icon, image. Whose image is stamped on the coin, he asked. You see, the imprinted image implied ownership. Now think about what that means for us. In God's story of creation, the pinnacle of his work is us, humanity. God created humans in his own image, as it says in Genesis 1, 26 and 27. Now, in the ancient Greek translation of the Old Testament, uh, it's called the Septuagint. I'll, I'll back up. In case you're not familiar, about 200 years before Christ, 70 Jewish scholars translated the Old Testament from Hebrew into Greek. And this became the Bible. It was the Bible of Jesus' day. Um, in fact, the New Testament often quotes from the Septuagint rather than from the Hebrew because they're obviously writing in Greek. So when they translated, these scholars translated Genesis 1, 26 and 27, and it's about being created in the image of God. They, of course, they used the same Greek word as our gospel writers did in this account of the story we're talking about today. Image, icon. So just like our, say, a $20 bill, a piece of our currency, we too, we too have an image stamped on us. The image of God impressed upon our souls. And as I said, again, implanted image implies ownership. Giving to Caesar what belongs to Caesar means... Pay him what you owe him in his currency, money. Giving to God what belongs to God means paying God what you owe him in his currency. And God's currency is our very souls. Rendering to God what belongs to God means giving him everything we are and have. He made us. He owns us. He stamped his image upon us. And if we read scripture carefully and do a little bit of thinking, we, we can come to the conclusion that I, we actually can learn a lot about what does it mean to be created in the image of God. How are we like God? And what does that mean in terms of giving him back what is owed to him? Well, first of all, Bearing God's image implies that we ourselves are creative beings because God is creative. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. God created the great sea creatures, Genesis 1.20. Boy, did he ever get creative with those wild and crazy critters in the ocean depths, didn't he? Got to watch some of those BBC specials to appreciate that. Genesis 2.7, the Lord God formed the man from the dust of the earth. You see, being, bearing God's image, every human has the capacity to create, to form new things. Artists make things with paint, musicians with notes, poets, writers, philosophers, and, and lawyers. They, they form arguments and write books with, with ideas and the compelling use of words. Doctors, I would say you know, doctors make people healthier. Consultants make organizations better. Manufacturers make things with raw materials. Contractors make buildings out of concrete, lumber, and steel, and plastic. Chefs create meals out of various culinary ingredients. And moms create adventures out of story time. 
every human has the capacity to create new things, to, 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 to uh, form things that, that didn't exist, and you, you bring them into being because you, you just think and you, you, you just create stuff because we are all made in the image of a creative God. And like God, we experience great joy in this act of creating. When we make something new, we, we feel his pleasure. So when we stagnate, when, when we fail to care about being creative in our lives I, 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 and in our service to God, I, I say we're falling short in our duty to render to God what belongs to God. Is there an effort in your life to create something new, something, something fresh, impacting, or, or beautiful for God's glory? Can our creativity spawn better ways to exercise our dominion over this wonderful creation? Think outside the box. Push the envelope, as they say. Give God what you owe him. Be creative. And if you're a Christian songwriter, for instance, uh, you know, being creative means more than just putting the word Jesus in a poorly written song. <laughs> Dig deeper. Be creative. Secondly, bearing God's image implies that we are spiritual beings. God, because God is spirit. The spirit of God was hovering over the waters, says Genesis 1-2. Contrary to the atheistic materialism of our culture, every physical human body is also a spiritual being. We are far more than just the sum total of our physical parts. Our spiritual nature, though unseen, is just as real as our, our physical nature. So what are we doing with our spirit? Are we nurturing it? Are we feeding it? What resources are we devoting to focusing on our spiritual life, our union with our creator, as opposed to just filling our days with physical tasks? Nurturing our spirit with prayer, with Slowly reading the Bible, because we can do that fast sometimes, because we're in a hurry, right? There's lots of things to do. Slowly reading the Bible, contemplating, just talking with other people about the goodness of God. All, the, all these things, I, 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 I would say, that, you know, obviously they're just as important as eating and drinking and exercising is to, to the physical body. Nurturing our spirit. Give God what you owe him in this area. Honor the importance and the significance of your spiritual life. A third truth about bearing God's image is that we are designed to communicate deeply and meaningfully with others because God communicates. He speaks. God said, let there be light, and so forth. Symbolic language represents the sharpest break between humans and the rest of God's created order. It's, it's part of our entrusted authority over the created world. Our ability to communicate conceptually offers us not just an intimacy in relationship, but also the capacity to share abstract ideas far beyond what any other creatures can do. And how cool is that? This beautiful gift comes with the package of being created in the image of God. So consequently, we, we need to use our communication skills to render to God what belongs to God. And certainly praise and adoration, as you guys so well do, uh, singing of hymns and choruses and the sharing of the gospel message, but also just the good use of our tongues in everyday conversation. How we speak to other people. How we speak to other people, as it reflects an, our understanding of being created in God's image. The words that come out of our mouth, they are a reflection of the desire of, like, what are we desiring to be? How we speak with others is a big part of properly rendering to God what belongs to God. He is the maker and the owner of our tongues and the source of our very ability just to speak. Give God what you owe him, or what we owe him, from our mouths. A fourth truth about us is that we are intelligent beings because God is intelligent. John 1 verse 1 says, In the beginning was the word, logos, 
the Greek term meaning reason or logic. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Logical, sequential thought, part of being intelligent, flows from the orderliness of God's mind. Though we may not consider ourselves to be intellectuals, each of us possesses a spectacular mind and a unique way of thinking and learning. Jesus commanded us to love the Lord your God with all your mind. Because of the divine-like intelligence imprinted on our nature, though we possess different intellectual abilities, we're all called to develop our mental capacities to their fullest so that we might glorify God and suitably as we exercise wise and proper authority over his creation to which we have been entrusted. A fifth truth about bearing God's image is that we are relational beings because God is relational. The phrase, let us make God in, or sorry, make man in our image reveals a fellowship within the very nature of God. Now, we call it the Trinity because we don't know what else to call it. But God's basic nature includes personal relationship. And that relational quality has been imprinted on us as humans. I mean, this capacity for connection obviously involves both divine and human relationships. The, the Genesis account is very clear. Right from the beginning, it says that uh, God made Eve for Adam uh, because it's not good for a man to be alone. Now, as great as our relationships can be at times, um, I'd say it's easy to think exactly that, like they're ours. <laughs> now, mistakenly, we consider our relationships to be something that we possess, something that exists for our benefit, something that exists for our pleasure. And I would say that's, that's wrong thinking. The ability to enjoy relationships is part of the gift of being made in God's image. So we need to think about how to behave properly in those relationships. Is there stuff in the Bible that says specifically about how I am to behave in this particular relationship? Then I, I better pay heed to it. And we also need to reflect just upon how our relationships are helping, not just serving us, but are helping to pay back to God what is owed to him. But also part of bearing God's image is the gift of humor. The enjoyment and power of humor is rooted in the very nature of God. Now, if you doubt this, you should just try reading God's sarcastically humorous descriptions of pagans building idols in Isaiah. There's a couple of beauties. Isaiah 41, I think 6 and 7. There's another one, Isaiah 44, I think 12 to 17. These accounts are hilarious. And if you can't imagine even, say, Jesus having a sense of humor, that suggests you need to watch a few more episodes of The Chosen. See, some of you have. Do you think Jesus never cracked a smile? Do you think Jesus never teased his goofy disciples at the wedding of Cana once in a while or at the, at the many parties that, that he attended? Oh, I, I think it's safe to assume Jesus had, had a good sense of humor. But, you know, ha having... No, here's the problem. With, with humor, I understand. Everything that's created by God gets misused and abused. And, of course, humor is almost at the top of the list. It's so abused and misused. But having a healthy sense of humor can be very valuable in providing the medicine that heavy hearts need at times. You know, like the preacher in Ecclesiastes says, there's a time to laugh. So even our clean and clever humor can play a role in giving back to God what is owed to him. And finally, being God's image bearer implies that we are morally accountable because God is a moral being. And the Lord God commanded the man, you are free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For when you eat of it, you will surely die. Just as there are natural laws of physics that govern the operation of the universe, there are universal moral laws that govern human behavior, obviously recorded in God's word and written on our hearts. And our selfless, obedient response to this moral framework is a huge part of making our payment of the, the debt 
that we owe to God, give to God what belongs to God. Now, please hear me properly. I am not at all suggesting that we can earn our salvation through some scheme of good works. But what I am talking about, what I am talking about is the need to properly understand and respond to the truth, this big truth of being created in God's image and being bought with a price. We, as his redeemed ones, have a duty to glorify God in our bodies. As the Apostle Paul so well summarized in Romans 12, verse 1, he says, we need to give our bodies to God because of all he has done for us. Let them be a living and holy sacrifice, the kind he will find acceptable. This is truly the way to worship him. Now, I may be wrong. Correct me if I am later. But I don't think just part of an animal was ever sacrificed under the old covenant. It was the whole body that was offered in sacrifice, just like Jesus on the cross. Give to God what belongs to God, your whole self. Opponents of Christ and Christianity always have and always will make regular attempts to challenge the true way to God. And just like our story today, many questions that are directed our way will not be genuine. They won't be sincere. they will be either attempts to slander Jesus or try to make our faith look silly. But as we also saw in Jesus' response to his opponent, the big picture answer to any confusing question or any confusing situation, I'll say that again, the big picture answer to any confusing question or any situation is always the same. Whatever else needs to be done, whatever else may be involved in this matter at hand, give to God what belongs to God. And when we stop and think about what it means to bear God's image, to both possess measures of his qualities and to carry his stamp of ownership upon us. We are at once struck with the grandeur of unlimited possibilities and the tragedy of unrealized potential when we're lazy and just plain selfish. To be fully obedient in our response to our maker's gracious gift of life and salvation implies that we be more deliberate about reflecting every aspect of being made in his image. Give to God what belongs to God as the pinnacle of his created work, creative work. We have a high calling to exercise dominion responsibly and righteously over all of God's created order so that he might be glorified. That is our calling. And to fulfill this calling, we can't just like, whatever, sail along. No, no, to fulfill this calling, we need to release ourselves to be more creative. And we need to stir ourselves to be more thoughtful about enriching our spiritual lives. According to our ability, we need to develop our intelligence and our communication skills for his kingdom and for his glory. We need to care about how our relationships and even our sense of humor can be used to serve the Lord and not to serve just to serve ourselves. And we need to be morally upright and purposely about our faith walk of obedience in following the Lord Jesus. Yes. <laughs> Give to Justin what belongs to Justin. That's the simple part. Just take out your checkbook. But far, but far more importantly, as divine image bearers, give to God what belongs to God, your whole self. Heavenly Father, your word is truth. I just pray that you would forgive us for in some ways being lazy, for not thinking deeply about what it means to give you what belongs to you. 
And so, Lord, we pray that you'd peel back the blinders on our eyes, deliver us from the habits that keep us back, that we can see you in your glory and see what it is, this magnificent thing that you have created us in your image, that, that we belong to you. And we owe you everything. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, we're going to uh, take communion together now. And uh, hopefully you grabbed one on your way in. One of uh, We still got a number of these little communion packs left to go that we'll be using through the summer. Um, one of the things that was happening in, uh, in the early church that Paul writes about in 1 Corinthians was that, uh, you know, what we've been talking about this morning, this idea of the relational uh, component of being made in the image of God was not being observed. And when the people came together, they were using it as a way of relational elitism, as it were, uh, that some people were getting a lot to eat and some people were not having very much. Some were getting drunk and others had nothing to drink. And uh, this was a problem. And uh, Paul says this flies in the face of why it is, in fact, that Jesus died for us and what it is that we are celebrating when we come together. And so that is a, a big part of it. When uh, What we are remembering and celebrating is that God did create us. He created us in his image, and this is a good thing. It is for his glory, and it is something to be celebrated together. And there is a relational component to that, of course. And, uh, you know, it's, uh, it was a little bit of a different celebration then than how we do it now. It was a party. It was an event. There was lots of food. But we are going downstairs to, uh, to share a meal together uh, this, um, this morning as well or this afternoon. So I think that that is a fitting thing uh, and a good thing for us to be able to do together on a communion Sunday. So as we prepare for that and as, uh, you know, we think about these things... Uh, that we have heard talked about this morning, that we have sung about, that uh, we heard read. Let's just take a moment in silent reflection as we come before the Lord. And uh, let's ask of him, confess that which we need to confess. Give praise and glory for those things that we give him praise for. And uh, to continue to ask his help and to thank him for uh, his death and his resurrection that has made all of these things possible. So let's take a moment in silent reflection now as we prepare to take the communion. Father, when we come together to observe the Lord's Supper, we want to be able to rightly represent the sacrificial death of Jesus Christ, the true character of God. And because of your death and resurrection, you have made these things possible. And we thank you for that. We thank you that you have made relationship possible. We thank you that you have given for us all that we truly need. And as a result, we can give to you, and Lord, we come to you and we confess that we have not done so uh, to the extent that we should. We want to give part of ourselves, but we're so hesitant to give all of ourselves, Lord, in true humility. And so, Father, uh, we are reminded of that, and it's good to be reminded of that as we come together and as we celebrate uh, your death and resurrection. Uh, Father, we, we ask forgiveness for this, for holding back of ourselves, for not giving you the glory in all aspects of our life that we are to give you glory in. And Lord, we ask for your help in this. Uh, you know, we have talked much and, and sung of uh, and talked about the gifts of the Holy Spirit and how the Holy Spirit is able to empower us for this thing. And we trust in that, that your Holy Spirit is able to give us that strength to give you the honor and the glory that you deserve with our whole lives. And so, Lord... Uh, we confess that we have not done that faithfully and we ask your help and the, the help of your Holy Spirit to be able to do that faithfully. Thank you that you give us this gift. And Lord, as a result, we come to you now and we give 
praise and thanksgiving, and we take of this communion now to remember that, to remember what it is that you have done for us and that you have made all these things possible. And so we thank you and we give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen. And so as, as Paul uh, talks about this scenario that I mentioned in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, he says this, For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night that he was betrayed, he took the bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and he said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's partake. And in the same way also, he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink of it in remembrance of me. For as often as you drink of this, or eat of this bread and drink of this cup, you are proclaiming the Lord's death until he comes. Let's proclaim that. Romans chapter 12, verse 1 tells us this, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers and sisters, by the mercy of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. So let's go in that in this week ahead, and even as we go downstairs to share this meal together now, let's uh, actually, we might as well take this opportunity to pray God's blessing on the food that we we're about to eat together. So Father God, thank you for this morning, and we thank you for this reminder of who we are in Jesus Christ, and that we have been created as people in your image fearfully and wonderfully made. We thank you so much for this, Lord, and may we give you the glory in all of those areas of our lives. God, thank you that we can share this meal together now. We pray that you would use it for the furtherance of your kingdom, for the blessing uh, of, your, of our bodies, Lord, that uh, we would uh, use this strength, the nourishment that we would get from it to uh, serve you and uh, to give you glory. So thank you for this time together and for the hands that have made this food. In Jesus' name, amen.